I did my graduate degrees, my master's and my PhD at the Australian National University. Uh, and that was in the area of uh, political science and international relations. The topic was on think tanks. Um, and the reason why I chose think tanks, that actually arose out of my master's um, degree. Uh, in Australia at that time, they still did um, master's degrees by research. So I had a two-year research master's and I did it into um, the topic of the privatisation of Australian higher education. So um, Australia was going through some considerable changes in financing towards higher education and opening up the system, the Australian system, to foreign students. Uh, as a consequence, it created a lot of debate within uh, Australian politics and the community about um, financing for higher education, about how many foreign students to let in, um, how uh, higher education institutions would benefit for it. So there's a lot of public debate, and uh, but one of the key groups that were involved in shaping the debate, if you like, making some very important interventions into uh, the discussion and having uh, some considerable impact in getting reported in the newspapers, uh, but also being taken notice, noticed by the uh, Minister of uh, Education, uh, were bodies like the Centre for Independent Studies. This was one of the newest think tanks in Australia at the time. And what I noticed was that, um, yes, the education trade unions were having influence in the, deba in the debate, but also it was uh, think tanks, Australian think tanks, like the Centre for Independent Studies, the Institute uh, for Public Affairs, um, that were shaping much of the discussion about higher education and the need for students to pay or contribute towards the cost of their degrees. So both domestic students and international students. So this start was one of the um, trends that lead to, led towards the development of um, freeing up the marketplace in higher education for um, uh, fee-paying students. So it wasn't. So that was my master's topic, okay, uh, which is quite different from the PhD topic. But because I saw these think tanks playing a key role in the debate, I thought I'd do a comparative study of think tanks, okay, for my PhD. And in Australia, there were relatively few think tanks. Uh, we could count on two hands, I think, the number of think tanks, which was surprising. This was in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. All you had to do was look to the United States and you'd see hundreds of think tanks, hundreds of think tanks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, I looked at the United Kingdom uh, and there were many more think tanks in Britain as well. So one of the questions I wanted to address is, you know, what is a think tank? No, not many people knew about think tanks at that uh, point in time. Um, are they influential? You know, if so, who are they influential with, and how are they influential? Okay, and also, why are there so few in Australia? <laughs> um, why is it that, uh, let's say, compared to Canada? Um, which was similar as a Dominion country of the United Kingdom, uh, why had so few developed in Australia relative to Canada and the United Kingdom, but also the United States as well. So at that time, it was, um, it was a very new topic. Uh, when I did the background research for it, in terms of which scholars were actually addressing this topic, there were maybe six people in the world. Uh, and I eventually got to know them all. Um, and Kent Weaver was probably the main person. And incidentally, he's been attending the ICPP conference as well. So he's here. He was one of the founding fathers, if you like, of think tank studies. Uh, 
so uh, so I could see very quickly that there was uh, a very small base of scholarly literature on think tanks and the kind of roles that they played in policy and politics. There was quite a lot of journalistic information that could be found, but these were very short um, news reports about a single organization maybe producing a, um, a report on this, that or another policy uh, problem or issue. There wasn't um, a lot of consolidated work looking at a large number of think tanks and there was very, very little uh, work at the time looking at think tanks uh, comparatively. So my master's got me on to my PhD, uh, led into a very different topic, but uh, I'm pleased I did the, the, the PhD on think tanks. It took me a long way, okay. Um, I can remember when I did, I started on my PhD on think tanks, a member of faculty said to me, oh, it'll never amount to anything, it's just a cottage industry. <laughs> Uh, but of course today there are well over 6,000 think tanks worldwide. So yeah, it's been a huge development over the past um, 20 to 30 years of think tanks. Uh, not just continuing to grow in the United States, Canada and um, other Anglophone countries, but also throughout Asia, throughout the transition countries of Central and Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union states. So it's, it's been worldwide growth. Yeah. Well, the methods are multiple, I think, for think tanks. Um, they adopt several organizational strategies, but those strategies have changed quite substantially over time. So when most people think of think tanks, they tend to think of the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. And yes, it's the granddaddy think tank. Uh, everybody knows uh, about Brookings, but they also know about Chatham House or the Royal Institute of International Affairs oh, in, in the UK. Yeah, yeah, Council on Foreign Relations. These are the um, large, old uh, institutions that were established um, to fit in between the university sector and politics and policy making to help inform policy makers of. Um, to provide research and analysis uh, to assist policy makers. Um, but the kinds of reports and analysis that was produced, um, let's say, in the interwar years and afterwards, was quite scholarly uh, in style. Uh, there was still a tendency for um, publications that came out of think tanks to be like books or thick reports, you know. So it was, that's what I mean by old fashioned. It was the traditional printed product um, that took quite a lot of time um, to read, let alone produce. So there were long lead times in the research. Yes, they were. Uh, these organizations um, were very policy focused and addressed quite critical questions of public interest and policy maker concern. Um, but maybe they were producing reports in a style that we're not so familiar with today. And one of the big changes that came about was when the Heritage Foundation became established. Uh, it decided that if it was going to have influence, then it needed to adopt a different style. Uh, so instead of producing thick reports, it produced a, a shorter, um, readable, uh, less jargonized um, policy briefs. And there was the briefcase test in the days before the internet, <laughs> okay, uh, you needed to get a two-page brief in your briefcase, multiple copies of, because you'd be carting it from the think tank office um, up to the hill to give to policy makers who only had the time, okay, this is the important thing, to read one or two pages. And if they didn't have the time, then it was their very busy advisors and uh, personal uh, support team that did the reading. So Heritage was um, a catalyst, I think, for a transformation in the style of policy uh, advice that came from the uh, think tank scene, certainly in the United States in the 1980s and 1990s.
Okay, so that was one. So that was how selling ideas changed. Um, whether those ideas had impact, uh, this, is, this is a difficult thing. There's no straight answer you're going to get from me or many other think tank scholars. <laughs> because you need to look at short term, medium term and long term influence. You know, ideas can take a long time to settle into uh, public thinking, let alone policy thinking. So you've got to look uh, at the long term um, processes as well. And this goes to Keynes's famous quote that, um, you know, policy makers are um, deciphering the ideas of some long dead defunct economist. I haven't quite quoted correctly. But that is the general gist of, of the uh, claim that it takes a long time for ideas to, to settle into a consensual understanding. And this is more at the paradigmatic level. Okay. I think uh, that, that uh, many think tanks demonstrated that they can have quick influence uh, by pushing a certain uh, set of policy recommendations and policy proposals by accessing the right people, you know, establishing the communication networks uh, in order to push their ideas uh, through. Um, so, you know, the organizational strategies are very important. And I think one of the interesting organizations to look at, uh, not in the United States, but in the United Kingdom, is the Overseas Development Institute, which is the oldest development studies institute in the UK and quite big, good reputation, um, tends to produce sound political analysis. It's respected in the university system as well as within uh, political and uh, policy circles. Um, but they had um, some internal questioning, if you like, about their effectiveness as a think tank. And it led to the development of a research program that led to the, the creation of a unit inside um, the institute, which was called RAPID. Okay? RAPID is an acronym that stands for Research and Policy in Development. Uh, it became the RAPID unit. Uh, and what it looked at was um, what they could do to make ideas more powerful and effective from the think tank. Okay. Because they were uh, experiencing pressure from their benefactors and donors to demonstrate that they were actually having influence. Okay. Uh, so they uh, developed a series of workshops, um, uh, website materials, uh, tool book, but in particular, um, a template of different styles of policy entrepreneur. Okay, so they argued that think tanks or the staff within them needed to be uh, policy entrepreneurs on the premise th that ideas do not sell themselves. You have to make ideas matter, you have to make ideas sexy, you have to go out and sell them. Okay, and there are different ways of selling. Uh, so it's to tell a story, to develop a narrative around a, a set of a, a problem and then um, the kinds of solutions that are needed for that problem. Um, there is the idea of the policy entrepreneur as an engineer in the sense of developing the technical tools, um, providing the, the scientific advice, you know, much more hands on, getting your, ha your hands dirty in the policy work different type of policy entrepreneur to the storyteller. The storyteller is good at, with media. Uh, the engineer is good with those who actually implement policy. Okay. So they're just two of the particular styles that Rapid talked about um, and advocated as a means to uh, make think tanks more influential. Because the constituencies differ. I mean, it's not just uh, a politician. Uh, it could be an advisor to a politician. It's influence in the media. Sometimes the, the best way to get an idea broadcast is to speak to journalists and then politicians hear about th uh, think tanks and their research secondhand through watching the TV or reading newspapers or their Twitter. Uh, 
Yeah, so the indirect routes are just as important as the uh, very immediate um, means of having a discussion with a minister or their advisors. Yeah. So many different routes. So this is what I mean by no single answer. Yes, yeah, sure. mm. uh, Political culture. Uh, and certain path dependencies in the way in which um, Australian political institutions developed, but also the tax system. Mm -hmm. So in the United States, yeah. uh, most think tanks are set up uh, as what are called um, 501c3 uh, organisations, and 501c3 is a code, a tax code, okay? Uh, and if you're a 501c3, then it is possible for both individuals and corporations to write off their contribution. Uh, so it provides incentive, I think, for um, individual and corporate uh, interests to make donations, both large and small. Now, obviously, in the United States, there you have a lot of big donors. Uh, but again, coming back to Heritage, Heritage was excellent at mass marketing and got a, a very large volume of individual donors who gave small amounts. But the large volume actually generated a large amount. Also, the United States has a much stronger philanthropic culture than Australia and um, to a lesser extent Canada. I think that's changed slightly over time. Um, but in Australia, there was a tendency uh, to assume that state institutions would conduct these kinds of activities that many of the think tanks in the United States would do. So th there has also in Australia been um, a range of research and analysis organisations set up inside government, uh, whereas that's not necessarily um, to the same extent in the United States. Um, but I would say also philanthropy is a big difference. Um, it's, it's not as extensive in Australia compared to the uh, United States or the United Kingdom. And that provide a funding stream for think tanks in uh, the United States. So they had that fuel, that lifeline that wasn't there. It was a little trickle in Australia. Some think tanks have remained domestically focused, but from the 1980s, as think tank numbers increased, there was uh, a lot more interaction going on between think tanks across nations. And you could see it particularly in some areas uh, like the European Union, uh, as, as the Commission strengthened and the range of its activities widened you saw a lot of think tanks collaborating to provide advice uh, to home governments on the EU, but also seeking to interact with um, commission officials and to provide advice within um, the European Commission about various areas of policy. So that generated the formation of some European-wide networks. But it wasn't just the EU, okay? Uh, in other parts of the world, you did see the emergence of, uh, it doesn't have to be international or global, but certainly regional networks. So within Asia and the ASEAN area, there, have been, there has been the emergence of think tank networks. And one of the oldest and most well-known think tanks is the ASEAN uh, Institutes of Strategic and International Studies. Very strong network, very tight. Um, directors of institutes of strategic studies who all got to know each other very well. So we had a lot of social capital in the early days. It's continued on, small group, that helped in the coherence. And uh, it was very effective as a um, think tank network uh, because of the political patronage some of those uh, institutes enjoyed, particularly in Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, uh, you could argue maybe the Philippine branch was a little more independent, autonomous, a bit more in the American style and connected to a university. Um, but the circulation, the regularity of meetings meant that uh, 
they were quite good in building personal relations, but shared ideas and things like this. Um, but the route of political access was very important as, as well. And as the Anaisis has been accredited by many different scholars as having a key role in the uh, formation and of the ASEAN Regional form, uh, Forum. Now, when I say formation, I mean in an agenda-setting way, in the sense of providing the research and the analysis, the argumentation and the legitimation as to why such a forum was needed. It was certainly taken over by political actors in terms of launching and maintaining. But in the early days, ASEAN ISIS was quite uh, important. Um, some people are arguing today that the Shangri-La dialogue is very important in the secu security debates of the region and bringing together the right kind of people for high-level discussions. So the idea of track two and track one um, diplomacy dialogues, track two and a half, you know, they have different varieties of uh, diplomacy um, depending on the level or degree of official involvement. Or individual yeah. So, so that, that's very interesting. That's more of an international networking between think tanks. You see it with uh, environmental institutes. Okay. Uh, you see it today around the uh, group of 20. Okay. The group of 20 is not a typical international organization. It's more like a club of member states. It doesn't have a secretariat, a permanent secretariat or international headquarters. It's, uh, instead, it has a troika system where the previous um, host country of the G20 process uh, works with the current host who then also works with the next host. So there's a kind of a circulation of responsibilities in the Troika, but because that they're without a formal secretariat, they're very reliant upon external sources of advice. Uh, so within the orbit of the G20, you see <coughs> there's obviously the Sherpa track, which is very important, but there is also um, Think20, okay, yeah. that provides research and, yeah. But not just Think20, there are other... Uh, there is also Business20. Business20, Civil Society20, yeah. Youth20, <laughs> Labour20, uh, and there was also Women20, I think, at, uh, in Berlin um, earlier. Uh, so, yes, there's a proliferation of non-state 20 actors, uh, and not all of them are as influential or as powerful as the others. So Business 20 is much more influ influential, yeah, yeah. And um, I would say the, the influence or relevance, let's put it that way, the relevance of Think 20 fluctuates depending on which country is the host country for the Leaders' Summit and the degree of access they get from one year to another. So that's more of a transnational network of, of think tanks. And you see, see these networks in different kinds of policy sectors, I think, uh, that are um, uh, more transnationalized anyway. Um, so there's that. Now, you asked about epistemic communities. Yeah. All right. Think tanks are not necessarily epistemic communities. They might become part of an epistemic community. Uh, but I would say that think, uh, epistemic communities are relatively rare entities. Okay, um, Because I tend to go by um, Peter Haas's definition of a think tank uh, and not the short definition. He's long four-part definition, which says um, uh, that an epistemic community is defined by, um, oh, can I remember it, um, a commitment to a causal knowledge, that there is an intersubjective understanding of, about the causal knowledge that defines the, the policy problem that they're addressing. So an epistemic community must have that um, shared causal knowledge, which is very important. And think tanks do, necessar do not necessarily have shared um, 
knowledge uh, because you can have divisions, you can have epistemic disagreements within a think tank or within a think tank network. It can be quite a broad church. Okay, uh, but let me see if I can think of an example of, um, of an epistemic community. One of the ones that he talked about, Peter Haas, in the special edition, he's, one of his contributors talked about cetologists. And these are uh, marine biologists who study whales. Okay, and this uh, epistemic community was very important because it could provide quite conclusive evidence about declining whale populations, which could then be fed into worldwide debates about banning whaling. Okay, so that epistemic community was one that was quite influential at a particular moment in time. I think there's been a bit of backtracking on the whaling agreement, um, but at the time that it came into effect, cetologists were very important to developing um, the scientific information to legitimate the need uh, for the ban on whaling. Okay. Um, and uh, so they were quite important players. And you can see different kinds of experts and scientists playing a similar role in other fields. So smoking. Uh, we now take it for granted that you don't uh, smoke in public places. Uh, because there is a scientific consensus about the damaging effects of smoking. But that was a case that had to be made 20 and 30 years ago. It's really only become entrenched in the last decade. And I think we've forgotten it took a long time to develop that consensus and to translate it into public policy. Yeah. 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 about out of a sense of frustration um, with, with public space outside the nation state. Okay. Uh, in terms of my research and the kinds of activities that I look at, I'm very interested in a variety of practices that go by a number of different names depending on who's writing about them and whether they come from business studies or political geography or international relations. So I'm interested in, uh, sometimes they're called global policy networks, global public-private partnerships, multi-stakeholder partnerships, global programs, that's what the World Bank's calling them now. Uh, they, as I say, they go via um, a number of different names. Um, and a few examples would include um, the product development partnerships in the field of health that Susanna Boras writes about. Uh, another example would be the Global Gas Flaring Reduction Initiative, uh, which very few people know about in the public domain. Uh, uh, there are a variety of different kinds of um, arrangements, global environment facility, they tend to be quite issue specific or problem specific in the field of health, in the field of urban development or d uh, disaster reduction where you get partnerships between different countries um, <coughs> or partnerships between uh, governments and the private sector and non-state actors. Um, very diverse sets of arrangements, okay. Uh, and I could see all these sorts of things occurring, but not very well accounted for in terms of where they're operating in terms of the global public sphere, okay. And the global public sphere is not like the public sphere at the nation state level, in the sense that you have a, uh, the notion and concept legal concept of sovereignty. Uh, you tend to have um, clear centres of authority in terms of a national government and the architecture of the state, okay, things like that. And you have a citizenry as well, which identifies with these kinds of political institutions and their rights and responsibilities between uh, both. So the public space is very well ordered and defined and, 
uh, well as understood inside the nation state. Okay, but it's not so well defined between states. Instead, there's you know, or, or above the nation state, uh, where many of these partnerships and global programs are operating, um, but also global civil society as well. So I wanted to come up with an idea that could account for this space, which was without the kinds of institutions and legal frameworks that you could see at the national level, but in which there were still elements of public authority and delivery of public goods and the involvement of both official actors and private actors, whether those private actors were from uh, corporate sector or from civil society organizations, scientific bodies, the whole gamut of non-state actors. Uh, so I wanted also uh, to have a space that was not necessarily democratic, okay? Um, because I think it's way too early to be s describing that. So I, I actually was reading uh, some material of, as a con related to looking at epistemic communities. There's a lot of literature on the knowledge society and uh, there is a book um, about the knowledge agora. So that was my first introduction to the idea of agora but I investigated it further and went back to the Athenian city-state. Okay. And when it comes to the Athenian city-state, the agora is actually a physical space. Okay. It was a built space. It was part of the very structure of the city. Okay. But it was about, the agora was the public sphere. It's both the marketplace but it's also the political institutions, okay? Um, and importantly, and sometimes people forget that this is also part of it, it was also a militarized space, okay? So it's, it was the area where you undertook your daily life, uh, but it was much more fluid in the sense that you didn't have um, very, the same kind of ordered, structured sets of of um, public uh, and private institu institutions of this public space that is associated with the modern day state. So I wanted something that was sort of preformed, uh, that would uh, take into account the flow of activity, the impermanence of the structures of um, the global public sphere also to suggest the power hierarchies that exist in it as well. Yeah, um, because in the Agora is composed of those who have the capacity to act in those spaces and it tends to be those with the resources, those who come from wealthy states or who are wealthy themselves. Um, yes, you go to international meetings, the gender disparities are often very noticeable, the differences between North and South. Most, most deliberations are transgovernmental in the sense that you see um, national affiliation, uh, sorry, national actors, whether they be judges, bureaucrats, uh, people based in line ministries, interacting with their counterparts in other countries. So, for example, if you're interested in the, in reducing the trade in, um, oh, endangered species, you know, you'd be interacting with um, uh, border control people. Uh, from one country to another. Um, so that, that is the kind of general dynamic. So the expectation is that uh, if you're interested in these kinds of questions, uh, you take it through normal uh, routes uh, in your own country in the hope that maybe these sorts of issues might be taken up. But what is also, I, ha I think, happening in partnerships that are 
involving uh, corporations partnering with international organizations. There's a devolution and delegation of authority to bodies that the public is not even aware about. So yes, there is media coverage of the intergovernmental panel on climate control. People know about that. People know about um, international organizations like the IMF or the World Bank. Uh, but they don't know about um, partnerships like the one I mentioned earlier, the Global Gas Flaring Reduction Initiative, or um, the Global Forum for Health Research, or Cities Alliance. That one's better known. City, Cities Alliance is better known. So there are some very issue-specific global programs, as the bank calls them, the World Bank, um, that are not on the radar of the public's attention. Uh, and it's not just the World Bank that hosts these particular kinds of partnerships and sometimes helps create these kinds of partnerships. So they're partly inside an international organization, but they're also partly out. So they can, they're kind of semi-privatized, okay? Um, uh, which means that it's very hard uh, to pin them down, particularly for um, a community uh, that has to go through local levels, national levels, international organization levels. So as I say, the, uh, many of these global programs are out of the sight of publics in countries. And it takes a lot of time to learn about these organizations as well. So you have to have a very, very strong interest uh, to want to pursue accountability issues like this. But I think the best way to do it is to do a master's degree <laughs> in international policy or global policy and you know pursue these th um, so education actually I think is a great route but it's a long-term yeah route for for doing this uh, having knowledge about these kinds of programs mm. transnational administrations it's you know it's not a well-known phrase is it yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of new. Uh, and what I was thinking of when I used that phrase was the secretariats of these kinds of partnerships. Okay, So they often receive funding from international organizations, from corporations. Of, uh, so um, Gavi. Gavi is one of the world's best known global partnerships as a partnership between the Gates Foundation, a number of, of large pharmaceutical uh, companies, the World Bank and uh, a couple of other international organizations plus national governments. So it's, it's a partnership. Um, so uh, these partnerships need to be run. They need to have headquarters, they need to have um, staff, they need to have um, financial plans. Um, so these are the things that I mean by transnational administrations and they put into practice or implement um, in country, okay, they need their national government partners to help assist in the implementation of policy or the delivery of, in the case of Gavi, vaccines and immunization programs. Okay. So it doesn't mean that implementation is at the global level. The partnership is in financing, decision making, delivery and implementation as a shared responsibility. But you need an architecture of administration in order to make that happen because it's, it requires a lot of policy coordination between the private and public actors or partners, as well as policy coordination between countries and levels of governance. There's difference amongst people. So depending on who you interview, you might get a different answer, which is fine. Terms are not always settled. When I talk about transnational administration, I do mean something different from international public administration. I tend to think of that as the secretariats of international organizations. Okay. So in a much, you know, um, of UN agencies. Um, 
the European Commission I think of as an international public administration. And, and national actors still remain important. They're really quite crucial. And sometimes they come into the agora, yeah. stay there for a while, maybe not, and come back. So it's, it's not as if it's exclusive to just transnational administrators. Those transnational administrators still need their national and subnational counterparts yeah, yeah. in cities, for example. Yeah. Hard and soft transfer, uh, l looking at processes of policy transfer. And I suggested that uh, soft transfer was easier mm -hmm. because it's the spread of knowledge, it's the spread of ideas, it's the uh, spread of different um, information about how to do things. But the spread of hard policy tools of legislation um, is much more difficult because it has to be politically picked up and enacted upon. So the adoption of um, specific policy tools and approaches from one country to another is less um, apparent than the spread of knowledge. It's easy to spread ideas. Yeah, okay. Um, so that means, you know, you do see um, the obvious example that people use is the spread of the Ombudsman Institution, uh, which has gone around the world and has been adopted, but it's also been adapted dramatically. Yeah. So an Ombudsman Institution and the laws and um, assumptions surrounding it is going to look different in Turkey as opposed to, let's say, the United States or New Zealand. Failures provide the best lessons, I think. Uh, there's a propensity to learn more from a failing. Uh, uh, so as a consequence, it's, I think for scholarly reasons, it's quite interesting to look at failure. Uh, but also, I would draw back from the dualism um, that is often presented by success on one hand, failure on the other it's much more interesting to look at the different gradations in between because they give a more nuanced story about the elements of failure or the partial success rather than thinking it is just one thing or the other. And then also you've got to look at the idea of success or failure uh, from whose perspective. What might be a failure for uh, one constituency uh, might be a good outcome for another. So who you are, or who you re represent, is also important for making that argument about uh, policy success or policy failure. But negative lesson uh, drawing often comes from uh, unexpected events, from crises, from uh, exogenous pressures. Uh, so for example, um, Hurricane Katrina, you know, that was... Uh, uh, provided a lot of negative lessons. Um, also, um, when the tsunami came through Asia, you saw a lot of humanitarian organizations rush in and uh, development, um, overseas development bodies, the bilateral donors, and there was a huge amount of duplication. And I think it's good to have that questioning attitude. Uh, but I don't think we should throw away experts or expertise uh, because no matter what, uh, there are still going to be public policy problems. And I, for one, would rather see well-qualified, appropriately trained, experienced uh, advisors provide the kind of um, expertise that is needed for a particular problem having input to that, alongside others, uh, so not just uh, technocratic advice at the expense of um, advice that might come from um, religious communities or social movements or whatever. That is also valuable for other reasons about fairness, justice, equity, all those sorts of con considerations. But I think um, in a highly technologized world, <laughs> 
uh, we do need to have some respect for scientific and technical knowledge and the expertise that, that goes with it. Um, but that is also means it's incumbent upon um, experts to explain themselves better in the world, yeah, uh, and maybe to better develop um, ways of outreach or explanation to communities. It also means, I think, that publics need to take, publics, communities, citizens, need to take um, care about the sources of their knowledge. And one of the problems with the wealth of information that comes from the internet is that there's too much information. Uh, so I think we as individuals, um, but also we as communities, need to develop better skills as editors in terms of discerning what is useful and good knowledge as opposed to um, the information that is used towards alternative fact exercises, um, to put it one way. Um, so I think that, yeah, there's a need for, for new skills um, in order to better process the information that we receive, and we receive too much information. Um, whether it's through Facebook or, or through uh, newspapers or scientific journals and websites, we need to be able to better handle information to work out and respect uh, those sources that are more reliable, credible, rigorous and systematic and open. Yeah.